welcome to the United Palace of Spiritual Arts and specifically welcome to the Open Heart Conversation. My name is Reverend Arda Itez and I will be flying solo today because my partner in crime, Reverend Jose, is not here. He is on the beaches of Puerto Rico as we speak. So I would imagine he's probably not thinking about us, but we're thinking <laughs> about him. So. Thank you, thank you for being here and for our friends online, thank you for joining us. We have a really magnificent and special afternoon planned for you. Our guest for today is Ianifa Reverend DeShannon Barnes Bowens. And before I get into her formal introduction, she is going to gift us with a very special water blessing called a libation. Good afternoon, everyone. A libation is a water blessing that we do in many traditions, and it's no different of the Orisha traditions where we are paying homage, homage to ancestors, homage to earth. And this is something that um, is one of the most sacred prayers for me in my practice and many Orisha practitioners all over the world. So we're going to begin this way and I'm going to start with singing a song, and I'll say the libation in Yoruba. And after I say this in Yoruba, I will give you the English translation so that you know what I just said. <clears throat> Ome <laughs> Awajuba Dada, Oko, Oro, Korikoko, Awajuba Oshumare, Babaluaye, Ibeji, Awajuba Oya, Olukun, Awajuba Yeye, Oshun, Awajuba Iyami, Aje, On Ile, Yewa Jobi Odu, Awajuba Bobo Risha, Awajuba Bobo Orun, Awajuba Egungun, Kiki Egungun, Awajuba Baban La Ara Orun, Awajuba Iyan La Ara Orun. Fresh water, fresh water, fresh water. To freshen the path, to freshen the way, to freshen Le Royer, to freshen issue. May death be no more, may evil be no more, may negativity and evil intention cease to be. We give praise to the highest of the high, the creator supreme being who comes manifested is all of the forces of nature whom we call the Orisha. We salute the owner of this day and all Orishas from Eshu to Oshun. We salute the primordial mothers, the feminine forces of nature. We salute our sacred fathers and mothers in heaven, the mediums of the ancestors, as well as our guiding ancestral spirits. And with this last drop, I honor the spirit of my father, Ernest Cole Bowens, who recently joined the realm of the ancestors. And when we close a prayer, we say ashe, which means and so it is. And now I'm going to invite all of you 
to stand and join in a song as we have called the ancestors, we've acknowledged them, and now we want to sing a song where we give praise. It's called a gungun wa, which basically means please come ancestors, ancestors come today. And I'm gonna ask all of you to clap because I'm holding this temporarily. You're just gonna have to see me do like that. But I'll start it and then I'm gonna ask you to start clapping and then Reverend Tracy on the drum is going to join in with us. So it goes a little like this. Egungua Yana wane ni Yana wane ni Yana wane ni Egungua Yana wane ni Yana wane ni Yana wane ni Egungua Yana wane ni Yana wane ni Yana wane ni egungua Yana wane ni Yana wane ni Yana wane ni egungua Yana wane ni Yana wane ni Yana wane ni egungua Yana wane ni Thank you. You may be seated. That was just beautiful. Really, really lovely. Um, you know, DeShannon was a dean at the seminary that I graduated from. And I was actually, I wasn't going to say this until the end of the segment, but I feel called to share it now. When I first went into seminary, I wasn't, I didn't understand the validity of indigenous religions. I thought there was only the Abrahamic faiths. And since childhood, I was always called to something different. Since childhood, I was more consumed with the earth and all its creatures and um, you know, traditional Abrahamic religion just did not speak to me. And I thought, I thought it was wrong. It wasn't until I went to seminary that DeShannon taught our class on African spirituality that it inspired me to do the research of my own ancestry and discover that my ancestors are indigenous people. So it all made sense. And it made me realize that there is more than just the Abrahamic faiths. Um, and I have you to thank for that. So thank you, because you, you literally changed the trajectory of my spirituality. So I am eternally grateful. With that said, let me tell you about this magnificent woman who is sitting across from me, Reverend Ianifa, Ianifa, Reverend DeShannon Barnes Bowens, commonly called Ialewa, is the founder of Ilera Counseling and Education Services and works as a psychotherapist, professional development trainer, and spiritual counselor. Through Ilera, she offers workshops and programs focusing on sexuality and spirituality, sexual abuse, vicarious trauma, and wellness. DeShannon received a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and a master's degree in counseling from Pace University. She is an initiated priestess in the Orisha Ifa spiritual tradition and a member of a temple based in the U.S. and Ilaro, Nigeria. DeShannon is also, is also an ordained interfaith, interspiritual minister through One Spirit Interfaith Seminary, where she currently teaches and serves as assistant director. She is the author of Hush Hush, an African-American family breaks their silence on sexuality and sexual abuse. The second edition of her book inspired a full-length play of the same title, 
as well as an arts education program called Hush Hush, The Healing Project. DeShannon is the first recipient of the Bill T. Jones Award from the American Association of Sexuality edu Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, an Emeritus Scholar for State of Formation, and was recently published in the Journal of Interreligious Studies. Some presentations of her work have taken place at the American Academy of Religion, Harvard University, the Children's Aid Society, Washington University, New York Theological Seminary, University of Connecticut, and the Values Caucus of the United Nations. For more information about DeShannon and her work, visit www.ilera, I-L-E-R-A, ilera.com. Please join me in welcoming Ianifa, Reverend DeShannon Barnes Bowens. My God, that was a mouthful. And I just, and I only knew her as DeShannon in seminary. I thought she was, you know, just like one of the really, really cool deans that everybody loved. For so many of us, um, the Yoruba, Reba, uh, Yoruba Ifa tradition is something that's entirely foreign. So I've taken the liberty of gathering some information to share um, some of its history and background with you. Ifa religion is an indigenous, earth-centered, African spiritual tradition native to the Yoruba people of Nigeria, West Africa. According to oral literature, the practice of Ifa originated as far back as eight thousand years ago. Like almost every other world religion, the Orisha religions include teachings on the importance of positive traits and behavior, but with an even stronger focus on good character, humility, and the importance of family and community. What is different from the Abrahamic traditions that many people are more familiar with is the way in which these principles are presented in the Orisha religions. I'm going to read a passage from a paper written by Dr. Finlayo Woods. She's the founder of the African Diasporic Religious Studies Association. In 2008, she wrote, African Indigenous Spirituality, A Closer Look, which was originally published in the paper, Medium for People of African Descent at the City College of New York. It is said that the revealed religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, so-called because of their reliance on texts revealed by God to revered prophets, come from up and look down, whereas indigenous traditions of all kinds come from down and look up. What this means is that while the revealed texts, the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran tell practitioners of those faiths about who and what God is, based on information revealed to them from above, Practitioners of indigenous traditions have traditionally ascertained who and what God is and drawn conclusions about the nature of God from their experiences on earth and sent them upwards towards God. Of course, there is overlap between these categories as those who practice the revealed religions may also experience God and make inferences, but their main source of information is the text and it is the information given in these texts that tell practitioners of these faiths who God is, what to call him, and how they should relate to him. The Pew Research Center in 2012, and I found this fascinating, this was in 2012, stated that four million people worldwide are follower, followers of folk slash indigenous religions. According to anthropologist Sandra Barnes in her book, Africa's Ogun, Old World and New, African Systems of Thought, 70 million African and New World people are practicing Orisha religions in some form throughout the world. I find that magnificent, fascinating and magnificent. And this Pew Research, this study was done in 2012. I would imagine today, in 2018, that number has increased significantly. Why do you think that is? Well, first let me say that actually the number is 400 million worldwide in terms of folk and indigenous religions. 
and then the subset of the Orisha practitioners that you were just talking about, just like you said, is 70 million. Some people say that the number is 100 million. So it just depends on who you look at in terms of numbers, because it's kind of hard to count people who have not been counted, uh, who have been invisible or on the margins of society as it relates to religious practice. And the reason to answer your question that I think that this number is increasing, not just in Orisha religions or African spiritual indigenous traditions, but indigenous traditions across the world, is because of a call to be more embodied, a call to be more grounded, a call to be more connected and something about our ancestors is speaking to us because a lot of us tend to sleepwalk and it's time for us to wake up. What I found most fascinating in that uh, piece was that the revealed religions, meaning the Abrahamic faiths, go from up to down mm -hmm. and the indigenous religions go down to up. And I think really that's, that's the meaning of embodiment. Yes. You know, and I love the idea of having a personal relationship with God as opposed to somebody telling me what my relationship with God should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In our tradition, in, there's various traditions, so I want to say a few of them, uh, just to give honor to the various ways and cultures in which people practice. So my tradition is Ifa, as Rev Arda explained earlier, and it originates from the culture of the Yoruba culture of Southwest Nigeria and Benin. But then there's also during the transatlantic slave trade that people landed in Cuba, they landed in Brazil, uh, they landed all over this hemisphere to practice these traditions and connect with Orisha in different ways. In the United States, particularly, I believe that probably the most practitioners are following the Lukumi tradition from Cuba. That's very strong and prominent here, and I actually give so much honor to Lukumi practitioner Santeria because here those traditions were kept alive in this part of the country. They had to hide in order uh, to keep their practices going and merge them with some of the uh, Catholic saints. And it, because of the culture, it became its own embodied way of being. With the spirits that we call the Orishas in our traditions, the deities per se, they're known as forces of nature. And the reason that Orisha connection is so important is because it allows us a way to access our, our talents and our gifts. And so since we look at these deities as extensions of the divine and not the divine itself, we're able to find meaning in our lives by connecting with those specific energies. So to give you an example, I'm initiated first to an Orisha that is known as Oshun. And Oshun is an Orisha, an angel or a deity that is over um, fresh water, rivers, lakes. Some people associate Oshun with beauty and love and sexuality and fertility. And all of that stuff is great as well. But when I had my first divination and I was told that my Orisha was Oshun, and at first I frowned a little bit because I was given this sanitized, um, vanity picture of this energy, what I had learned is that Oshun was actually teaching me how to love myself as I am and to love my body as it is and to be connected to it and to then spread that energy out in the world and to walk with that energy so that others may know that they have permission to do the same. So you don't necessarily get to choose which Orisha um, you're going to be initiated to, it's chosen for you through divination. How does that process work? Hmm, I love that. So what happens a lot of times in our traditions when people go for a divination, or well, first I feel like I should say what divination is, just to show a hands in the audience, is there anyone um, who does not know what divination is by a show of hands? Okay, great. Thank, thank you for raising your hand. So divination in various traditions is a process by which you, you have 
a consultation with an ordained priest or priestess. And there's usually a specific oracle system that is used, and it's a spiritual consultation. So the person who's coming to receive a divination or a consultation may have questions that they need guidance on. I, in common language, refer to it as spiritual counseling with ritual. And so what happens is that there is a process that is specific to the spiritual tradition, and there are certain prayers and ritual where you're accessing energy in order to give the person before you guidance. So when Art is asking about this divination process of discovering who one's Orisha is or one's angel or guide is, a lot of people who are familiar with Orisha religions may come in with an idea that I think that I might be a Shango person. A Shango is an Orisha in our tradition of thunder and lightning, um, can be a warrior type, but also a kingly type person. For those of you who are familiar with astrology, I refer to Shango as Leo people. So whatever your vision is of a Leo, that might be a Shango type person. Uh, others may disagree with me who are practitioners, but that's just DeShannon's uh, connection. And so this you may be a person who is a Leo and who may be fiery and the life of the party and like to shine and a dynamic speaker and leader. However, you could have a divination with a priest or, a priest or priestess and it may come up that, ah, your Risha is Yemoya. You are to, you, this is who is speaking up for you. And Yemoya is an Orisha, an energy, a deity that is, depending on what part of the country you're from, is a very mothering energy, uh, an energy that gives birth. She is celebrated over the ocean to be the Orisha of the ocean in some cultures. In Nigeria, Yemoya is over a specific river, but the qualities are the same. Uh, Yemoya helps people to birth them, to birth themselves, to birth themselves. And if someone who is a Shango energy, which is very fiery and hot, has a consultation and it shows up that their Orisha is Yemoya, what that probably means is there is something where they need to cool down, calm down a little bit, and they need that water element in order to tap the essence of their gifts so that they can manifest what they came to do this lifetime. That's fascinating. How many Orishas are there? Well, okay, so there are many, many, many Orishas, and I admit that I don't know them all, Arda, and the, the reason why is, is there are considered 400 plus one on the right that are known as the, the, the I'll just say the positive Orisha. Wait, 400. Did you just say, I thought there were like seven. <laughs> I, would, I, just, I, I probably wouldn't have asked you if I knew there were four, you know, 400. Oh my God. Well, we're not going to go through all of them. Don't worry about <laughs> no. it, because uh, I don't know all 400. But yeah, 400 plus one on the right. 200 plus one on the left that are more so known as the negative forces. So that plus one is supposed to be a category for a number of other entities that can come into manifestation here on earth. But when you say that you thought there were seven, that's because pretty much here in the West, there are seven particular Orishas that are pretty common. Um, and in Lukumi in particular, they have a ceremony but where you can go through before you're even initiated where you can receive um, sacred necklaces that we call alekes for Orishas, for you know a number of the, people may call them primary Orishas, but there's a lot more than seven is the whole point. Wow, and they are men, male and female energies. Is that right? Yes, and that's some, I feel that in this time where people are talking a lot about gender, that that can actually be debated where people uh, talk about the Orishas. But just to make it simple and to stick to some of the mythology stories that is, exist in Yoruba cosmology, we do usually refer to some of the Orishas as he, male, um, she, female, feminine, masculine, but in essence, I think that there are a growing number of practitioners, including myself, who look at Orishas as just energy. 
just, you know, just energy to connect with and depending on what type of energy that we're looking to make a connection with, we may refer to that Orisha as masculine or feminine in that moment. But at the end of the day, a force of nature is just a force of nature. Absolutely. Would you share with us the creation story? Oh, yes. So there's many creation stories, but I believe I know the one that you're referring to. So I'm gonna share the one that has to deal with the Orisha that I'm initiated to, which is, again is Oshun, well, one of the Orishas I'm initiated to. So the story goes that there is Olodumare, and Olodumare is one of the names of God in our tradition. Olodumare had given Orisha a charge to say, hey, it's time to create the earth. Let's do something, let's get it together. And this is of course the Shannon's ad libs, just so you all know. <laughs> so come on, let's do something, let's make something happen. Let's create this planet called Earth. And all of the Orishas were male, but there was one addition, and that was the Orisha Oshun. So he sent all of the male Orishas and Oshun and he gave them all their charge and told them what they were to do and that Oshun must be included. So my assumption is maybe when this meeting happened, Oshun wasn't there, but Oludumare said, make sure Oshun gets the message because she has to go. So the male Orisha got together and decided, mm, we don't need Oshun. She's just a woman, we're pretty powerful, we got this. So the Orisha set out to form the earth. <laughs> they set out to form the earth and create the earth and everything that they did, every time they formed it, it fell apart, it collapsed. It wouldn't come about the way that it was supposed to. So after several attempts, and who knows exactly how many attempts according to this story, they went back to Olodumare and they said, it's not working. We did what you told us to do. So Oludumare says, well, where was Oshun? And they said, well, you know, kind of shuffling feet. You know, sometimes how people look down, and their parent asks them to do something, and you want to look down and not admit what you did. So they admitted that they left Oshun out because basically they saw her as insignificant. And so Oludumare instructed them that they had to go and beg Oshun for her forgiveness, that they had to make offerings and beseech her to come. And they had to call upon her. And so that's what they did, because Oshun being the Orisha of rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, some people say sweet water, nothing in nature can grow without that energy. So after their begging and beseeching and their offerings, Oshun came down, the water was there, things started to grow and flourish, and the earth was created. So there's a moral to the story, and the moral is very simple, that if you leave a woman out, everything falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> you want something done right the first time, right? As the old saying goes. <laughs> what, um, what are the basic tenets of uh, the religion? Would you call it, is it, do you consider it a religion? Would you call it a spiritual tradition? Because I know my own uh, indigenous ancestry, we were Tengris, hmm. and they referred to it as a religion, the religion of Genghis Khan. Um, and it's, an, it's only an oral history, but they do refer to it as a religion. Mm -hmm. It depends on who you talk to. Personally, I will say religion just so that people can realize that there are some systems in place. But for me personally, I refer to it as a spiritual path and a way of life. Because the word ephi itself means the nature of things. And so for me, it really is more a way of life. But to say that it's a religion, I feel is fine too. There are some people that would debate that. In terms of basic tenets, there are a few, and 
These, I would have to say, are probably pretty much standard for any African indigenous tradition, you know, throughout the continent, and certainly I believe uh, all of the Orisha religions as well. And the first for me, which is the most grounding and the most important, is that of ancestor reverence and ancestor communication, because it is the ancestors who provide us with a code of conduct in order to aspire to. They have a level of wisdom that we don't once they transition and leave their physical bodies. What often comes up, uh, not just at One Spirit Interfaith Seminary, but other places where I've taught, is that people have different feelings about their ancestors based on people who have done terrible things and committed harm against others. And what I would say to that is even when we have ancestors that have not acted in ways that were loving or a certain code of ethics, that we still learn by observing what they did so that we know what not to do. And by making that ancestral connection, we have the opportunity to create, to tell a new story because we stand on their shoulders regardless of what they did. So if we don't like what they did in the past, we can learn from the past mistakes and make a present different choice in the future. So ancestor reverence and connection is very important. The second one in terms of the concept of the practice would be connecting with the Orishas, which we've already talked about a little bit in order to be more in tune and in rhythm with the cycles of nature and the rhythm of nature and understand that we are just a part of it, not lord over it. Because if we were more embodied and in the flow with the connection of nature and these forces of energy that we call Orisha, we would be less likely to abuse it, to abuse the water, to uh, pollute the planet, uh, to abuse animals, plant life, and each other. So the Orishas in connecting with those forces is definitely a tenant. The third would be the concept of Ori, O-R-I. Ori is, in, my, in DeShannon's definition, is the divine aspect of who each and every one of us is individualized in physical form. So Ori is consciousness. It is that part of us that sees things beyond the human level and it is that spark of the creator individualized as us that is connected to not just the creator, the divine, but all of creation in the cosmos. And so with Ori, there is an essential teaching for me personally that I live by, and that teaching is that character shapes destiny. It's a concept that we call Iwa, I-W-A, Pele, P-E-L-E, Iwa Pele. So good character is extremely important, and we strive to live good character because we know that the more that we cultivate our character, the easier it is to live on purpose and to do good in the world. Would that be comparable to um, what we would traditionally call the soul? Hmm, is Ori the soul? That's an excellent question. You taught me well. <laughs> is, or, is Ori the soul? Hmm. Maybe. There's, there's a belief that I heard from my first mentor. I was very fortunate when I moved here. My mentors are, I have two sets of mentors. So I have my mentors here in New York, right in the Bronx, uh, who did my first initiation. And then I have my mentors in Chicago, um, the community that I'm also a part of there as well. And my first mentor, Baba Ola, he talked, I remember him uh, in one of his lectures speaking about how when we evolve and we incarnate from lifetime to lifetime, that we may have a different Orisha. We may show up as a different gender. Uh, we may show up as a different race even, or eth you know, different eth uh, ethnicity. But there are Ori is the same. So that essence is the same. And it made sense because we talk things in our communities, people talk about past life regressions, people talk about um, the ori of their ancestors, the consciousness of the ancestors that still is present, that guides us today. And so when I think of ori and soul, I do see, I do see a connection. That's something that I would have to sit with and make me go, hmm. 
Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's something I'm very curious about. Were you born into this tradition or is it something that developed later in life for you? It developed later in life. So I was born into the Baptist tradition, good old Baptist. If you hear an accent for the New Yorkers in the room, it's because I am from St. Louis, Missouri, originally. And the accent did not leave, it stayed. And I'm proud of it. I had to defend myself a lot when I came here. Not that I have issues with that now. But um, I was born into the Baptist tradition. And, um, you know, I, rem I mean, it was a beautiful church that I was uh, brought up in, a very charismatic preacher. And I remember the choir, and I remember being a little girl sitting on my father's lap and hearing the choir sing and tears just pouring down my face, just automatically hearing the harmony of the voices. I was that moved, and I probably was like five uh, sitting on my dad's lap. But as I got older, not but and, I started listening more to some of the messages and I realized at that particular church, the theology and the um, tenets that were being passed on were just things I didn't agree with. So as I decided it was time to go back to school, go to graduate school, and I decided to come here to New York, there were two things that I was certain of. One is that I was going to find my life partner, and I did. And second, uh, that I was going to find a spiritual path that was for me. And at that time, I thought that spiritual path was going to be something else Christian, but something else more progressive, where women had a, you know, an equal footing side by side with men, that was progressive on issues of sexuality and gender, sexual orientation. And that's just what I thought it would be, and it wasn't. I was led to a priest to have a divination. And I think you want to know how that happened? Of yes. course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I had a friend in Brooklyn who needed to have a ritual done. And all she told me was, okay, she calls me Shan. All right, Shan, I need you to meet me in the Bronx. I have to have this ritual done. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to be loopy afterwards. So since you have a car, can you meet me there and drive me back to your place? And so I said, okay. You know, and I'm looking kind of like, what is she doing? But she was a friend, so I was sure she wasn't getting into anything crazy. I took her, I, she went there, she went from Brooklyn, I met her there. And when I opened the door, there was a woman who opened the door and she bowed to me and said, Bishuela Dumare and hugged me on both sides, left and right. Her hair was wrapped, and then a man came and said, how are you doing? Uh, and then he kissed me on both sides and you know, gave me a hug, and I was like, wow, these people are really nice. And my friend was there, and she was dressed in white, and then she went in the back, and I just sat there on the couch, and I waited for her. And while I was waiting for her, and they were doing whatever it was they were doing, because I was not permitted to go in back, the uh, wife looked at me and she said, have we met? And I said, no, we've, we've never met. And also, I didn't look as I do today because my friend also scared me and she said, you need to make sure you look right, Shan. So she said, you need to wrap your head, you need to wear a long skirt, because these people can read your mind. <laughs> Was wrapping your head going to prevent them from reading your mind? Was that I the have no idea. But this is the, <laughs> this is the story. That <laughs> this is the story I was told. And so I just, so this is what I did. I kid you not. Um, I emptied my mind before I went because I didn't want them picking up anything. I didn't know, want them to know what I ate yesterday. If I said a cuss word, I didn't want anything coming out. And so. The, to move the story up a little bit, she had her ritual done. It actually turned out that it was something related to the concept of her ori. And she, when she came out, she was like floating. She was in all white, her head was wrapped, she was very serene and peaceful. And I thought, huh, this is interesting. And she said to me a day later, I think that you are going to be part of the tradition 
because that's what sometimes people in Orisha religions, they will refer to it as the religion or they will refer to it as the tradition. She said, I think you're gonna be part of the tradition. I said, no, I'm not. And she said, it's just a feeling that I have. So fast forward, she introduced me to her godmother that she was studying with at the time. I had a divination with her, a cowrie shell divination. And then she and I studied uh, Yemoya priestess and queens. Uh, we started doing some ancestor things together. And then when I wanted to know who my, where my ancestors came from, she said, I know just the place to send you. I thought I was going to see a genealogist who was going to research my family tree. And where did I end up? Right back in the Bronx, where I had taken my girlfriend to have her Ori ritual. And so still, That's I wasn't amazing. getting it. I'm a little slow sometimes. They opened the door and I said, okay, where's the computer? Where, how are we, maybe these, you know, this is New Yorkers, they're very entrepreneurial. Um, there's a computer somewhere and we're gonna sit down, but no, that's not what was happening. And what happened is, is that the sacred materials were out for me to have a divination. And I said, oh, I'm having one of these, but this looks a little different from the divination that I had with the Orisha priestess and queens. And I had a divination with this man, Baba Ola, who's a Baba Lao. And from that divination on, I said, this is something that I need to know more about. And I had no intention of becoming a priestess. I didn't want to be a priestess. And I told him I did not want to be a priestess. And he said, it's okay because you're a born priestess. I said, I know, you know, a little, like I know. And so he said, okay. So I practiced for five years. I connected with Oshun. I connected with my masculine Orisha Lumila just as a practitioner. And I did that for four or five years. And then it just kept coming up. I know you don't want to do it, but it keeps coming up. I know you don't want to do it, but it keeps coming up. So I said, fine, because I was happy. Life was good. I was helping people as a therapist. Like, I don't need to be a priestess. I'm fine the way I am. But as life has unfolded, I see why it was necessary to walk this path. And it really is an honor to do so. What has it done for you? What, is it, what has being an ocean priestess done for you, an initiated priestess? What has it done for you personally mm. in your own life? I would say the first thing was connecting me with my ancestors. I recently watched a video, um, a Haitian priestess, Mambo, Mambo Dewoti. Uh, she's in Haitian voodoo. And it was a powerful clip on YouTube. I encourage anyone to Google it on YouTube, Mambo Dewoti. And I don't remember the title of it, but it, the sentiment was that God can look like me. And there has been historically so much, you know, negativity, uh, trauma, violence uh, directed towards people of African descent. And then in terms of what this practice made me realize is the power, the potency, the beauty, and the brilliance of what our ancestors were connected to. So the first thing that the tradition did is it put me in deep reverence and communion with my ancestors and not just my bloodline. When I constructed my ancestor altar, I had, and I still do, pictures of people who were very inspirational. You know, I have James Baldwin on there. I have Nelson Mandela. I have Malcolm X, Dr. King, uh, Audre Lorde, Maya, Dr. Maya Angelou, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, and people, you know, outside, you know, in terms of African uh, ancestry. But connecting with my ancestors made me realize that if they can go through what they went through and endured, then I can go through life and live life to its fullest. The second thing personally is that it helped me integrate. It helped me integrate all parts of myself to be a more authentic human being. Because going through my life, there was places where in order to be safe, I had to dial it back a little bit. So you know, being a woman, if I was in certain spaces, I had to dial it back a little bit. Being African-American in certain spaces, I had to dial it back a little bit, you know, couldn't be too pro-woman, couldn't be too pro-black. 
and I'm also bisexual and I'm in a same gender loving relationship. So in certain spaces I had to dial that back a little bit. And after a while it gets exhausting dialing it back and just not letting the, the essence of my heart, the wisdom of my heart just shine through. And so in one of the early divinations, I remember asking my first mentor, what does the tradition say about these different issues? I didn't have to ask about race, that was a given. Uh, and by the way, in terms of this tradition, because I am asked this, people of all racial, cultural backgrounds practice this tradition. Practice this tradition, so there's no exclusion in terms of that. But I needed to know about women. I needed to know about sexual orientation. And he said, this tradition is about your character. That's what this tradition is about. It's about your character, and it is a path to self-actualization. And so walking that path, then my eyes were open and I was able to meet people in other traditions who were also walking that path of self-actualization. And they could give me guidance. And when I told them, talked to them about my story, they could relate. And so I have mentors, not just in Ifa. I have Christian mentors. I have mentors, uh, Native American, you know, indigenous. And I see the relevance and the beauty of all of it coming together, but I had to integrate in that path of integration and living without fear in full acceptance is the biggest gift that the tradition gave to me. Because I had to accept myself first internally versus looking for validation from other people. What you said you, uh, was so interesting. You said that um, you have Christian mentors and what I found is that once I began with such an aversion to traditional religion, but very similarly to what you just said, when I discovered my own ancestry and who I truly was, it gave me a different appreciation and understanding of your more traditional religions now, where now I have a genuine appreciation for them. You mm -hmm. know, whereas before it was just kind of like, Meh. you know, there's truly in all forms of, you develop a whole different understanding and appreciation. And the truth is, I mean, Africa is, the, this is the cradle of civilization. Mm -hmm. So clearly, this is where it all began. Do you see any correlation between the Abrahamic faiths and um, the indigenous uh, traditions. I see them in cultural things, um, where my ancestors are from originally, the traditions of the, the some of the practices in the, in the religion, this indigenous religion, have carried over into cultural aspects of, because my family migrated to Turkey, it's carried mm -hmm. over to the cultural aspect. So there's certain significance about, you know, 40 days or throwing water after someone if they're leaving on a trip. Mm -hmm. You know, this all stems to the um, indigenous religion, but now it's become a cultural thing. Do you find that? Do you find that similarity, let's say, in your, from your tradition mm -hmm. into your, um, the Baptist faith that you were raised in? I actually did, and you know when I made the biggest connection was ironically when we had a um, speaker come to the first year students at One Spirit's uh, Interfaith Seminary for Protestant, uh, Protestantism. Her name was? Dr. Carrie Jackson. No, and I love Dr. Carrie Jackson. Hi Carrie, if you're watching. Um, she that's was my awesome, big sister. you were awesome. She, she's Carrie awesome. Uh, but no, this is actually Reverend Dr. Karen Carlo. So hi, Karen, if you're watching. Um, we talked about Jesus and the, and so this is my connection. The way that people connect with Jesus and they talked about, talk about Jesus because Jesus it was an actual living being, to me is ancestor veneration. Jesus is an ancestor. Jesus, Jesus is an ancestor. Jesus was flesh. Jesus walked the earth. Jesus is an ancestor. And so to me, it's no different if someone wears a cross as a symbol. We have elekes that we wear, and I'm pulling one of them out. 
so you can see, where we have certain beads that are blessed to different, or consecrated to different orishas. And the way that people connect with Jesus and they do certain things to commemorate the death and the resurrection, to me that's just ancestor worship. So that's where I draw the connection. And there are people who are ordained ministers and Baptists, but there are ordained Christian ministers who also practice a variety of African indigenous spiritual practices. That was the next question okay. that I was going to ask you. Um, do you find, I was going to say, there, you know, there are a lot of people who are very devout in their Christian roots or Muslim roots or whatever the case may be, and almost feel like, oh, well, I can't you know, I can't get in that because it's almost a betrayal of what you were raised with or what you were taught to believe in. Um, what would you say to those people who have that call and that desire to get to know their roots but are kind of fearful and, th and, and see it almost as a betrayal of, let's say, the Jesus that they were raised with and genuinely love, you know, love and, and don't want to let go of. Do they have to let go of it? Do they have to let go of him? Hmm. I would say no. It's n because for me, it's not about letting go of Jesus. Maybe what is happening is that person who is connected to Jesus has been, Jesus has been put in a box. And maybe Jesus has been taught to that individual in a way that's too small. Because I know Christians personally. I've done divinations for them myself. I have had ordained ministers, Christian ministers, sitting across from me for divination. And there's no reason that someone can't get a divination and recite a psalm from the Bible. You don't have to throw away or get rid of something to be something else unless it in some way negates, inhibits, or suppresses the essence of who you are. So if that path of loving and worshiping and connecting with Jesus is life enhancing and nourishing, I say keep it and keep it and continue also to connect with the Orisha as well. I don't think Jesus would have a problem with it. That's just me personally. <laughs> I don't think Jesus would have any problem with it. I don't believe that the Orishas have any problem with Jesus. That's just me. I think they're all up there like, hey, what's up? What is, what is the spiritual practice? What is, a, um, what is a typical day in the life of a priestess? What does the spiritual practice look like? How is it incorporated into your daily life? Okay. So this is a fascinating question because it's different for everybody. Everybody has to tailor their practice to make it unique to them. And also you're dealing with the diversity of culture. So while I am practicing a tradition from Nigeria, my mentors are at, who took me through the initiation process are African Americans who were initiated in Nigeria. My first mentors here were, and then my uh, mentor in Chicago had some of um, her initiations in Nigeria. But then you bring it back here to the States and you're in the culture of the United States of America. And so the culture, to me, culture shapes practice even when these different traditions uh, come from different countries and cultures. So I can only, I'm saying all that to say that I can only even, I can't even speak for the African American culture as a priestess, I can only tell you what I do. So here's a day in terms of DeShannon's life. I have an ancestor altar. So every day that I get up, I connect with my ancestors and I say a prayer. Uh, there's an act that we do called Bale, B-A-L-E, Bale, and it means to prostrate or something as simple as touching the ground. So let's say my ancestor altar is right here. I, it's an act of reverence, I touch the ground, I come back up, I say my prayer, and I go about my day. Uh, some people, in terms of divinations, they may do a divination for the day. I don't do a divination for the day. Um, I do a divination for the week. And I have also have a monthly 
ancestral ritual that I do every month that is specific divination with the ancestors. And then I also have a weekly specific prayer practice with Orumula that I do in a certain ritual with that. And so my practice is very organic in that the ancestors is the point of contact. I do something for my Ori. And something from my Ori is not probably as traditional as maybe some other practitioners in Nigeria or other places might connect with their Ori. And remember earlier I said Ori is essence, your consciousness, that divine spark. So for me, my Ori may guide me to say, okay, your Ori practice today is that you need to walk outside, you need to go to the Bronx River Parkway, and you need to be in meditation and do a walking meditation. That may be my Ori practice for that day. So I wait, I have my things, of course, ancestor every day, my weekly divinations, my weekly uh, specific prayer ritual, because I pray every day, but this is enhanced. I have my monthly ancestor ritual, but day to day I have to be present for the moment to listen in meditation and listen to what my spirit tells me that I need for that day. And given the hectic life of New Yorkers, you know, sometimes I might just have to, I mean, I don't do this, but it might just be something as simple like that. Okay, I gotta go. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't do that, but I'm just trying to give you all an example that it depends on what's going on, but I know that spirits are always walking with me. Even the times that I don't pay attention and they have to get my attention to slow me down, I'm never alone, I'm never by myself. It's lovely. So one of the things here that we have a tendency to do, you know, at the open heart conversation is, uh, and when Reverend Jose is here with me, we get so, um, we get so entranced with our guest that we forget that there's an audience full of people that probably want to ask questions. So I'm trying to be mindful of that, of that today. And, and I would like to open up this conversation for questions for anybody in the audience. Um, please, if you have any questions, for Ianifa, Reverend DeShannon. Please raise your hand and I would, she'll be, I'm sure, happy to answer them for you. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions? I see someone, it's very hard, the lights are directly on us so it's a little bit hard to see so if, you might have to wave a little harder. <laughs> Do we have, we're gonna get you a microphone. We'll get you a microphone. You know what, we can give you this one here. Yubi will be right over. Hi. I was Hi. just curious. Come closer. We can't see you at all. Come a little closer. Can you see me now? Um, I just wanted to, I was just curious. The person that gives you the divination. Yes. That person, where do they get there? How do they develop? Are they born with those qualities? Do they study it and then become some sort of, you know, higher up and then can give you divinity, uh, the divination? Great question. So let me just repeat to make sure that I have it. So you're asking that a person who actually does a divination, how are they able to basically give the divination? Are they trained? Right. Is it something that they're born with and they just have it? Mm -hmm. They're trained. Okay. <laughs> so they, they def you definitely have to be trained. Uh, you have to be initiated and trained in order to give a divination for someone. Like your Baba. Say that again, dear? Your Baba, your first the first person? Yes. Yes. So I was trained by my uh, first Baba, him and his wife, so Baba Ola and Io Oshinsina. And then when I went through my next initiation 10 years later and became an Ianifa, then I was trained by that temple as well. So yeah, so to receive further training because there's different oracle systems that people use based on the types of initiation that they have. And you have to be trained in order to do that because there are people who are initiated and who are priests, but not everybody gives divination. And I also took the first part when you talk about people being born with it. And then there are people who just, you know, you could sit across from them and 
They could tell you things about yourself that has nothing to do with an oracle system. Thank you very much. Thank You're welcome. You. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I believe I see a hand back there. <laughs> Yes, I have a question about like our ancestors as far as reincarnation goes. Um, do you know if any ancestors actually go through the reincarnation process and come back as um, like into their same family as babies? And if so, do they choose like certain relatives or certain couples or whatever to come back through? Like how do they choose who to come back through? Because I know sometimes I've heard that they come back through like um, they will come back through the same family, maybe through the grandchild or the great-grandchild or so forth. Thank you. So there's, we do believe in, in reincarnation and coming back. And I don't know how um, consciousness chooses who to come back to, but what happens is, is that in some of the naming ceremonies, one of the questions that is asked sometimes is whose ori is this that has returned? And so that person, uh, through divination, they can determine who that, you know, who was that, who was here in a former physical incarnation that has returned. And then sometimes divination can reveal what is the purpose of this person's life returning. Did that answer for you? Uh, it does. My, my, um, one of my relatives recently passed and um, my mom also believes that my grandfather came back as my son because <laughs> she sees very much similarities in their personalities and even the way they look. Like my son has gray eyes and my grandfather has gray eyes and he was kind of the only one in his family that had them. And my son is the only one out of my three children that has the gray eyes. So she she's always says, oh, that's, that's grandpa, you know, he came back. <laughs> so, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Hi. Hi. Um, you started to talk a little bit about how after you were initiated into Oshun, your perception of Oshun changed. Yes. And I was just so drawn to that, and I wondered if you could say more about it. So say more, just so I'm clear, to say more about how my perception of Oshun changed after I was initiated? Yes. Yes? So the thing is, is that actually my perception started to change before I was initiated, and then it was just solidified after I was initiated. But as I told you all earlier, is that I was given a very surface um, picture of Oshun, that Oshun was someone who uh, was basically in the mirror all the time, you know, had to have on her makeup, wear her perfume, was a man stealer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> love I, to be I the life of the, the party, I don't that. center of attention. <laughs> I mean, some of these stories are just a, a trip. So it was very surface and it was very vain. And I was like, that's not my personality at all. And so what happened is it also was through my work. I work uh, in the area of sexual trauma and sexuality. So I've worked with a lot of survivors, mostly adult survivors of sexual abuse, and working on um, conversations and education about the intersection of sexuality and religion. And so connecting with Oshun actually helped me to see the sacred side of sexuality that is just not based in the trauma that people experience. And so I started to see Oshun in that. I started to see Oshun more deeply in nature and I began to link, just for myself, I believe that the abuse and the pollution of the earth, and specifically the waters, is linked to the abuse that we allow to happen to women and children. And so that is something that, that what I just said right there, didn't come to me until I was initiated to Oshun. So just really paying more attention to things that sustain life, that nurture life, and as well as things that uh, give birth. You're welcome. I believe there's a question down here. Oh, we have two. Okay. Hello. Hi. My name is Daniel. I want to thank United Palace and the speakers as well. Uh, it's been very stimulating the conversation. Uh, so my passion is sort of community development and spirituality, sort of finding a bridge between those two realms. So. It might be a very loaded question, but maybe if you just 
sort of allow the spirit to lead you through the concepts that I ask, okay? So it may be a three-part question. So okay. uh, community development, so what role does a community play in sort of your spiritual system? Because I think oftentimes in Western religion, it's more individualistic. But mm -hmm. to me, the value of African religion is more community-based. Okay, so, so community. And what can the Black Liberation Movement, Latino Liberation Movement, learn from the Odisha okay. in today's times? So, um, and what's the biggest obstacle in a black community or a Latino community to sort of embrace the Odisha, maybe talking about animal sacrifice? Okay, so let me just recap, all right. Okay, the role of community, number one. Number two, black liberation, Latinx liberation. Three, um, what, what the biggest obstacle to more uh, blacks and Latinx people practicing this in particular is the concept of animal sacrifice, something that keeps. And just the biggest obstacle may be mentioned or touch upon animal sacrifice. To me, that's one of the biggest, that's a big issue. Okay, all right, so let's start with the role of community. Uh, you cannot practice this tradition uh, it, without community. Even for me, uh, my mentors, they did not, there's, okay, there's a word called ile. Ile uh, means house. And so in many Orisha communities, uh, they, people will have ilays that they were gathered in. So it's not in a, a building like this. An ilay is a spiritual community where people of a specific lineage, whether it's Ifa, Lukumi, uh, Candomblé, etc., where they come together and they worship and they do rituals and give guidance and the community usually initiates someone. So community is essential for me. Uh, my first teachers, they, they had a community, and then they scaled down a little bit, but even without having it formalized the way that they, to my understanding, it was much larger before I came onto the scene. I'm actually one of the babies of the group, and I'm no baby. Um, and still I had the sense of family and community with them. Though it was smaller, that was still there. We would do things, we would go, um, I think the fall equinox, we would get together, we would go sweat, you know, and uh, at a reservation and participate, you know, in the sweat lodge. And we would get together on the fall equinox. The uh, Yemoya priestess in Queens, she would do things for the ancestors, for Ori. And though the different people that she invited were not in my intimate community with my mentors, there was still that communal feeling because she sent the invitation out and everyone come. So you need community. There are some people who decide to withdraw and go their own way sometimes once they are initiated because it's some spiritual communities can be abusive uh, and not holistic. And so some people do that. And if that happens, that still doesn't mean that you can't practice in your own way. So that's the first part. The second part is about black liberation and Latinx liberation. And I'm trying to get more understanding. Do you want to know what is the theology of that in Orisha religions? Or what, what exactly is it that you wanted to know about that? Um, just more so, um, what, what could you say? Maybe the connectivity and community. Maybe how could the uh, sort of Orishas, of course, uh, they would need answer veneration, but it's also something you get in exchange. Like we, so how, how can, you sort of bridge the Odisha to the Black Liberation Movement in a way that sort of, um, in a way that is practical in, in today's contemporary society? Okay, all right, that's a great question. And that's something that I will need to, hmm, but I'm gonna give what comes to mind off the top of my head, which is not to practice in secret and to stop hiding. That remember when I was talking about dial, I was, was dialing it back here, dialing it back there, dialing it back here. One of the places that I would dial it back was even being a practitioner. I've been practicing for almost 17 years. And people, there are people, not because of my own omission now, because it's on my website, but people did not know that I was a priestess for years. They were shocked. You know, I didn't have my head wrapped in a long skirt. Um, I don't wear my alekes every day. I wear them when I feel like it. Um, and that has nothing to, that's just a, a personal thing. Uh, but part of it is really coming out. And I get why we hid. 
because there has been direct, uh, you know, discrimination and bias, people um, slandering the tradition, misunderstanding it, and the same way that people have risen to uh, combat anti-blackness in different forms, you know, throughout different, um, like in media and uh, politics, we see people rising and standing up. Um, and you can say, you know, Afro-Latina as well, really, Afro-Latinx. Latinx, for those who wonder why I'm saying that, it's because I heard uh, a prominent speaker in the sexuality field advocate, who was Latina, advocate for X to include all genders versus O or A. So I didn't make that up, just want y'all to know. Um, so even, you know, for those communities, to, for people to stand up and assert, this is part of my culture, it's not less than, I deserve to be at the table like everyone else. And for me, since I'm very much involved in interfaith, I am consistently advocating for the indigenous traditions to be at the interfaith table. And if we are not included and given a seat at the interfaith table, then we need to go construct our own. We should have our own anyway, but we, you need to have everyone there. So I feel that coming out of the closet, um, really working on releasing the shame, because it is trauma that is built into years of having to hide and suppress because you could be killed for practicing these traditions, that it is the healing of that that will lead to our liberation. And then your last piece, I hope that somewhat answered uh, that second part. The last piece in terms of what blocks, that also has to do with the prejudice, the lack of understanding that was systematic. And um, I think that the whole part about animal sacrifice is used as something to drive a wedge. And there are other religions that do do animal sacrifice. So for those of you who don't know, Animal sacrifice is a part of the practice. And as I say uh, to everyone, some people believe in it, uh, some people don't. But what has happened interestingly with this tradition is that people have made animal sacrifice and said that it's the most important central part of the tradition. And that is completely not true. Not everyone does animal um, sacrifice. And indigenously, the purpose of that is that if someone, I let me think of something like a, I'll just say a hen, and they did divination and they said, we need to offer a hen for, uh, for, for some serious reason. There is a ritual that is done in the offering of that hen. That hen is looked at as sacred. That hen is cooked and prepared and usually most times eaten by the community for whatever meal that people are going to eat. And the thing with animal sacrifice, I say if people wear leather, uh, that's, that's an animal. If you eat meat, um, are you there? If you, grew, if you didn't grow up on a farm, are you there when they're actually butchering the animal to prepare it to be sold in the grocery store? And the purpose of animal sacrifice, it's, it has to deal with the blood. When oxygen hits blood, that it, you know, it immediately you know, starts to, to change and decay. So it's something that has to do with the manipulation of energy. But what happens is, is when we have groups that are on the margins and that have been oppressed, people take the one aspect of that tradition that is out of step with what the dominant culture says is okay, and they paint the whole tradition in one broad stroke. So if people can be educated about these traditions and focus more on what I have been speaking about with Rev Arda for the past, I guess, hour or so, then I think some of that would break down the resistance. That's actually, I think, an excellent question because as that was one of my concerns as, you know, discovering my indigenous roots. I was like, oh my God, does that mean animal sacrifice? But the truth is, animals are sacrificed all the time. We just don't see it because we see the finished product in the grocery store. Now, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not that vegetarian that beats people over the head and says that they shouldn't eat meat. It's one thing for an animal to be sacrificed to feed a community, and if there's a spiritual component to that, so be it. 
It's another thing, I think, of the senseless, you know, senseless slaughter of animals is something different. But what, what, um, what's being done in ritual, it's not like it's something that's going to waste more, than, more often than not. Mm -hmm. It's being consumed. Yeah, and can I say one more word about sure. sacrifice? Is that the whole purpose of sacrifice, removing the whole animal aspect from it, is that the, person, the purpose of sacrifice, the way that I view it, is to participate in an act that is in an effort to make something holy and sacred. So for me, in my practice, the way that I practice is that the sacrifice might be lighting a candle and the offering of a prayer. The sacrifice might be that I am so consumed with anger that I have to go through some sort of process and maybe sit across from a spiritual counselor uh, or some other type of professional to deal with my anger and release that and sacrifice that. I may need to sacrifice my arrogance in a particular situation, sacrifice my need of being judgmental and self-righteous. And so there's a more, um, broad definition of sacrifice and how we work with that in our tradition. And sacrifice is a part of life. If any of you are in a long-term committed relationship or parents, you have made quite a sacrifice. The marriage ceremony or whatever ceremony, if you are married, that's the ritual but the sacrifice happens after the ritual because that's when the real work begins. Any other questions? You said earlier that you believed, if, if I remember correctly, and correct me if I don't, but I believe what you said is that you believe that the abuse that goes on with women and children is directly connected to polluting and abusing water. Could, you expound, can, could you expound upon that and give us some more information about that? It's just a feeling uh, that, that I have that just came to me because we're very careless with the earth. The earth gives birth to a lot of things for our use and for our consumption, and I believe that we take it for granted. Women give birth to children. Children are the future, and we disregard children. We say that we love children in this country. I know we're very judgmental of what we see happening in other countries, but some of the abuse that we allow to go on, we're very indifferent to. And I know this is supposed to be the, the age of hashtag me too. These things have been going on for millennia and it's getting worse. And the uh, pollution of the earth is getting worse. And just as women are crying out um, and more people are getting involved in sustainability, environmental justice, I think that this is a result of the earth and people saying that they can't take it, that we just can't take it anymore. We have to rise up and we have to do something before it's too late. And so my connection with Oshun and particularly to water in my personal work, in my professional life, brought that to my awareness. And I just, I just feel that in my heart. I think we have time for one more question. I believe there was one over here. Okay, two more questions, if we make them quick. Uh, yes, I just have a very quick question. Thank you mm -hmm. for coming. Um, I am very drawn to the Orisha faith. I've mm -hmm. had divination. Mm -hmm. um, I had confirmation through, well, not confirmation, actually, more of a revelation through divination to become awashed in the religion. Um, mm -hmm. Since that divination about two months ago, I feel like I've hit a wall in terms of just feeling overwhelmed, not really knowing what the next step would be to join a community. I've done my research. Um, however, I found not a lot available. <laughs> so my quick question is, what are your tips for uh, individuals interested in walking this faith on how to uh, navigate it and taking those steps beyond uh, divination to actually become a part of the community? Okay, that's a great question. Well, sometimes it would be simply, you said that you've had divination, and we can maybe talk a little bit after we formally close, but usually the people who provide divination, 
may have some tie to a community and that could be a way to move forward with the person that you're receiving the divination from even if that person may not formally be in a community because sometimes there's people who are initiated in Nigeria or Cuba or Puerto Rico and Brazil and they might be here so their community might be in another country if it's not here but maybe they know someone who is part of a community that they could direct you to um, so that would be one way there's also organizations in New York that have different educational forms one I'm thinking of the top of my head is the Caribbean Cultural Center it's on East 125th Street between Lexington and Park. I forgot the exact address, but it's closer to Park. And they, if you just go to their website, I think it's ccadi.org, just Google Caribbean Culture Center, and look and see what kind of classes and offerings that they have. And that could be a way to find more information as well. But usually it's word of mouth. And when I've told people who are interested, especially uh, people who are interested in the branch of Orisha faith that I'm not in, to really uh, connect with their ancestors, to, uh, to put it out in prayer, that they be connected to the right people. Because I've seen that work for me when I was ready to go on my next step beyond Orisha initiation. I just put out the prayer and the intention and I trusted that when the time was right, that things would come together and that's exactly what happened. I didn't know who it was going to be, I just knew that it was time for me to make that next step in the journey. And I did. Thank you. You're welcome. We have one more question in the back. Hi. Um, so my question is not really quite a question, it's more about, I find it very fascinating that um, you're also a, a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And um, you have your belief, you know, in the Orishas. And um, how has Oshun helped you, uh, you know, integrate with your, um, with the people that you help, uh, with, with your belief? You know, how has she, because you've spoken a lot about uh, trauma, uh, mm -hmm. sexual abuse, uh, what does it mean, intimacy? How has she guided you um, to pretty much embody what, you know, through her work, through you spreading that love? And um, I guess because her concept, it, to me, it's not only beauty, but it has to do with self-worth. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of people that walk around very wounded, not knowing who they are. So I feel like you talking about Oshun has really sparked and hit deeply to me uh, because that's how I was raised. I was raised that I was told she was look, you know, looking in the mirror, she had to be blonde and beautiful. And what I'm finding out through my journey is that you need to love yourself first in order to spread love to others. And when you accept yourself, you're able to integrate, integrate with your divine self and with that divinity, you're able to accept others and see sides of you as mirrors to what you see. I, and I don't know if this makes sense, but I was just wondering that how, how has it been your journey ever since you've connected with her in spreading your joy and love with uh, the clients that you have? That's a great question, thank you. <laughs> You brought up the mirror, so I'll use the mirror as an analogy. So the reason, again, when I didn't know as much or study as much, and I would see this mirror, all I saw was vanity. When I would see depictions of Oshun looking in the mirror. And then what I got to understand is that uh, that mirror was really uh, allowing Oshun to remind us to to really see ourselves through our own eyes and not the ideas that others have implanted uh, within us. So I could be working with somebody who I see is a beautiful, holistic being who's so talented and gifted. And I just don't work with, you know, survivors. That was the, I actually now probably just do more general 
spiritual counseling, but when that was the majority of the work that I was doing, um, people had a self-concept that was either rooted in the abuser, the people who were bystanders and allowed that abuse to happen. And what really needed to happen is a process of teasing out those parts that really was not them. Somebody put that there and learn to look through their eyes at uh, the reflection with love and to see that reflection of themselves in a completely different way. I have some people in my workshop sometimes just stand up with their arms outstretched and say, I love my body. And I'll say, how many of you can do that? How many of you can actually stand up stretch your arms out and say, I love my body exactly as it is. And I was just at a, a workshop, I think uh, June 30th, and I was at a church upstate. And you should have seen the looks. People were like, well, I don't know. You know. <laughs> um, but it was a stretch, and that was a good stretch. And so we were focused on just holistic sexuality at that particular workshop, but that's Oshun work. That is, that's the real mirror work, looking in the mirror and seeing oneself through the eyes of love is the divine sees you, which is through the eyes of love. Thank you. Those are some really wonderful questions and comments. Shall we bring Tracy back out? Yes. Let's bring Rev Tracy. Where is, where is our Tracy? There Just she is. To give you a little bit of uh, background on Tracy, friends, Tr um, Tracy is also an ordained interfaith minister a drum circle facilitator, a ritual drummer, a musician, obviously, a Reiki master, and ceremony officiant. If you'd like more information about what Tracy does, you can find that at www.sacredspaceceremonies.com. Additionally, um, Shannon has kindly provided us with some information. It's actually information that is given to seminary students, and it's on that table, that pedestal uh, in front of the stage, which you're welcome to take a copy before you go. Please help yourselves. That's all been printed out for you. And it's more information on um, the tradition itself. Mm -hmm. And oh yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. So when you asked about more information, there's links, there's resources on there to, for more information if you want to read or just discover things that we didn't talk about today. So as they are passing that out, I want to explain to you how we're going to close this afternoon. And I want to just say now, thank you so much for having me, Arda, Reverend Jose, Dr. Reverend Jose Ramon, thank you whenever you watch this for inviting me and asking me to come. And thank you, Tracy, for coming and blessing us. I've heard Tracy drum, and it's part of this collective. And I have to just tell you, these sisters who gather in drummer can really shake the roof when they get together. It's really something amazing. And Tracy and I, we met at One Spirit. Uh, so I was just uh, glad that we could all come together in this way. So today is the full moon. And with the full moon, one of the things that I think about when I think of that brightness of the moon is the importance of self-empowerment and coming into power. And so if there's any One Spirit folks here from the, who just went through their first year of seminary, this, you'll get a treat because this will be a repeat for you. But we're going to chant, uh, do a chant called Bara, B-A-R-A. And you, we're all going to do this together. I know, aren't you excited? Aren't you excited? <laughs> and bara means, uh, it can mean, for some people, strength. It also means power. So when we say bara, we are trying, uh, we are saying it in, with the intent of raising up power. And while you all say bara, I will be saying origio, a chant origio. All you're going to do, all you have to do is say bara. B-A-R-A. -A. So let's, first, before we get started, can you just all say bara? Bara. 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 Okay, good. So we're, when Tracy starts with the drum, we're just gonna start chanting bara. Not yet though, bara. 
ba ra, ba ra. And as you chant, ah, thank when you. you. Start, when, when you I start. When I start. Okay, and as we chant ba ra, I am going to say a chant called origio. O-R-I is the first word, J-I is the second word, O is the third word. Origio means ori, wake up. So we want our essence to wake up. So when I, and that's my part, I'll be saying, Origio, and however I do that, all you are to do is keep chanting, what? Para. Para. And as we chant this, feel yourself becoming more empowered on this full moon and the importance of your own self-empowerment. So that's what we're going to do. Any question, girls and boys, boys and girls? Any questions at all before we start? Are we ready, folks? All right. Okay, Tracy's going to start, and I'm going to start the bara with you as well. May all those gathered here today, all of those watching now, all of those who will watch this at a later time, in this moment, be connected to the remembrance of their own divinity. May we all remember to walk into the consciousness and the light of our own power. May we all choose Iwapele, good character. May the ancestors remind us of our divinity and encourage us to make this world a better place for the next generation. 
and all the generations to come. Ashe, 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 Ashe. Join me in thanking, join me in thanking Ianifa, Reverend DeShannon Bowens, and Reverend Tracy Hamilton. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.